Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Let us open the meeting with our invocation. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you look over this body, this county, this country. We pray that you give us guidance and allow us to make good and wise decisions. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Okay. Well, I have the pleasure of leaving. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dr. Gatewood, would you please come forward? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you've invited me here this morning to introduce to you two of our great students, one uh, which will sing the national anthem and the other which will make some comments. It is my pleasure and honor this morning to introduce Daria Harris, who will sing the national anthem. Daria, please stand. This is Daria, thank you. And that's her dad sitting next to her, Mr. Harris. But she was singing the national anthem this morning, so get ready. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Let me tell you just a little bit about her. She is an Eastern High School student from Mebane, and she is president of the music club at Alamance Community College. She's been singing since she was a toddler. That's a long time to sing, Daria. <laughs> she also enjoys acting and dancing. She's majoring in college transfer, so she plans to transfer to one of our public universities, undecided as to which one. She's considering Federal State University, Winston-Salem State, and UNCG. So it's, that's going to be a tough decision, but she's going to make a great student wherever she goes, and she will major in arts. The next student I'd like to introduce is Ruth Mann. Ruth is from Burlington. Ruth, please stand. Ruth has been homeschooled and now she's an ACC student in our early college program, which is a very excited program within itself. She is pursuing uh, an associate in arts and plans to transfer to a public university in this state, a little undecided which one at this time, such as mm -hmm. Dario, and she will major in forensic psychology at the university when she goes there. So she's excited about that. I am excited about both of these students. Ruth will graduate this spring. And both of these students will represent Alamance Community College in Alamance County in Orlando, Florida, with it in two weeks at a student leadership conference. So with that said, Mr. Chairman, may I invite uh, Dario to the podium? Thank you. Thank you. Dario? And while she's walking up, let me say, um, both these young ladies were exceptional at your groundbreaking, I guess, what, a week ago, week and a half? A week ago. Um, and after that um, performance, I would say, and just real honor to hear you and your uh, presentation, I was just overwhelmed and begged Dr. Gatewood to have you come to us come for us. Thank you. I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you all for being present at the groundbreaking. It was a very, very exciting. Thank you very much. I think I can say too, you folks are going to be impressed. <laughs> so I would also like to thank you for this opportunity. It means a lot. So I appreciate it very, very much. And if everyone would stand, please. <laughs> Thank you. 
Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets regular the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled bear wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave the to be here. Um, as Dr. Gatewood said, I'm a, a student at ACC. I represent the college as an ambassador and it's a true honor to be a part of such an amazing school. I feel very blessed to be able to say that I attend there and I know that um, the opportunities I have been given will um, do me well when I transfer to college and I'm looking forward to that and I just want to um, thank you once again for having me all. Thank you so much. I want you both to at least consider Wake Forest and Eon. <laughs> not, not that I'm prejudiced or anything. I could consider East Carolina. <laughs> the vice chair says, some school east of here, East Carolina, I'm not sure about where. There you are. <laughs> You'll have more fun at East Carolina than Wake Forest. <laughs> we want to thank Dr. Gatewood and both both you ladies, exceptional. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand that we do not have any public speakers. Thank you. Therefore, I assume there are no commissioner's comments about the speakers. <laughs> Moving right along. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion as to the agenda? Second. Any comments? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Uh -oh. Chairman, I, I hate to interrupt. I didn't know there is a right archer with DOT. Is that matter still, is he still going to be speaking to you or are we skipping that? I'm sorry. Mr. Uh, Mr. Archer from uh, the uh, DOT is here. Oh, I. I'm looking at the old agenda and set the new one. I, I, I actually have both in front. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, okay. We'll come back to, we've now approved the agenda. We'll hold off on the consent agenda. And um, Mr. Archer. We really like him. He's from the DOT. <laughs> you're, you're, I've already had a request. <laughs> your, your real name is Mike Mills. Is that not? Yeah. <laughs> and this is that was a tough act to follow. So I'm going to have to put a plug in for East Carolina. After I'm there there too, and so. AT State University is where I got my engineering degree. From, so I do have to put a plug in for that. Uh, That's pretty good thank school you. too. Sir. I said they're a pretty good school. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, uh, thank you for allowing me some time on the agenda, and uh, I don't really have a, a formal presentation, just want to introduce myself. I mean, obviously, Mike Mills is, is a huge shoes to fill. I uh, started with the state about 31 years ago under Mr. Mills here in Division 7, so I uh, uh, took a position in Raleigh for five years, and uh, 
then moved to uh, Division Nine, started a, a design uh, internal design group there inside the division, and I worked there about 25 years. So I've been blessed to come back to Division Seven. Always lived in, in Guilford County my whole life. Uh, daughter is, is uh, just moved away from Allen X County. She was here for about five years. My son's up in Rockingham County. So it does feel good to come back home. I've always commuted my whole career. So um, now I'm 10 minutes from the house and, and get home quite a bit later than I used to anyway. But, um, but really, I just want to talk about um, communication. And uh, I'll, I'll have you, uh, you know, give you guys my cell number. Um, seriously, I want to be involved in the community. Um, one thing that kind of frustrates me with DOT is we're a little bit behind the eight ball sometimes on uh, on needs. We do have a lot of growth in the area, as well as, as, as you all know, uh, Alamance County, Guilford County, Forsyth County, that, that corridor is really is really kind of in the, in the magnifying glass right now for growth. And as a department, we want to try to to stay um, at least in tune with, with those needs and uh, and with, with y'all's help. And, and uh, you'll see me some more. Uh, COVID's kind of slowed things down. You know, I've been in this position a little bit over a year, and fortunately, I hadn't been out, out to meet y'all. But, uh, but do uh, just want to thank you for the time to, to introduce myself, and um, and I will provide my contact information. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer any questions. We'll be calling. <laughs> and I've already sent you a request. I've already in, wrote so, you a note. So we'll we'll, we'll get on that okay, uh, hopefully you. very soon. But uh, but seriously, communication is the key, I think, for our success. So, I want to follow up Mr. Mills, uh, his, his, his path. So, uh, <clears throat> absolutely, so. you have some big shoes to fill. Oh, absolutely. Like, did a great job. Absolutely. If we ever had a need, we could call him and it would get taken care of. So. Well, and I, w I want to continue that. I really do. And that's part of, part of why I want to be here. So, you, you know, uh, uh, you know, I want to be around the community and, and hear what you guys need. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much. And we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay, we're back to item number six, the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Any comments have been done? All in favor signify the same way. <coughs> Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Our county attorney, I think, is next. Actually, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to present this, but I've been working closely with uh, Ms. Bechtel on this item, so if it's all right with the chairman, and uh, I'll go ahead and present. Uh, so we, we have before the commissioners uh, to consider reinstating the Alamance County Industrial Facilities and Pollution Control Authority and to appoint members to this group also. The purpose of this authority uh, is to work with local businesses that meet federal criteria to qualify for tax-exempt loan assistance through the issuance of industrial revenue bonds. Uh, federal legislation has created this opportunity for small businesses that are involved in manufacturing and it does require a local government partner. Uh, the county authority has existed in the past. It appears to us, according to records, it last met in September of 2000. At the time, it met to assist uh, PureFlow Incorporated to acquire and develop the site they currently uh, make use of at 1241 J Lane and Graham. It was a su uh, successful effort then, a uh, partnership between the county and PureFlow, and uh, led to the uh, great corporate presence of PureFlow in our community, and PureFlow is once again considering expanding its facility at J Lane. And we're joined today by representatives from PureFlow leadership. Uh, we have uh, Lauren Holt with us today. Lauren is the Chief Financial Officer with PureFlow, has been with them for eight years, and came to PureFlow from um, Gillum Coble Mosier, which is now Gillum Bell Mosier, and Lauren's also a county resident. We're very glad to have her and PureFlow in our community. We also are joined uh, via Zoom by Mary Nash Rusher. Uh, uh, Mary is an attorney with McGuire Woods and she's been working closely with all of us to navigate this industrial revenue bond process. Um, in your packet, we included conceptual information about the plans that PureFlow is considering uh, for expansion at their site. And again, PureFlow is interested in using the industrial revenue bond method uh, to, to finance that. Uh, Ms. Frank's notes indicated that all the authority seats as it existed uh, before this time were vacant. So uh, all the seats are vacant at this time. So the commissioners would need to reinstate the authority and to appoint new members. Uh, the one criteria that I'm aware of for membership is uh, it cannot be elected an elected official sitting on the authority board. You have a proposed member list in your agenda packet. Uh, the proposed members would include myself representing the county manager position. Andrea Fleming uh, with the Chamber of Commerce, Jeremy Akins of the County Tax Department, 
Andrea Rollins, our Budget and Management Director, Peter Bishop, City of Burlington, Economic Development Director, Aaron Holland, City of Graham, Assistant Manager, and Preston Mitchell, City of Mevin, Assistant Manager. Uh, this seven-person board, if you reinstate the authority and appoint this uh, group of folks, would need to meet as soon as possible in order to work with PureFlow to uh, help them take advantage of this opportunity as quickly as possible. In fact, these members have all been contacted. They are willing to serve, and we would be able, if the board creates the authority again and appoints this slate, we would be able to meet November 8th at 10 a.m. to get this ball rolling for PureFlow as soon as possible. On November 8th, this authority would pass a resolution uh, to, to get the process of industrial revenue bonds started for pure flow. After that, the authority would really only meet as needed. It's important to note that this industrial revenue bond process does not have any cost to Alamance County, so there's no financial uh, burden or cost to the county, and it also has no bearing on our debt capacity and or our bond rating. This is our role is the local government is to create this authority, and then that group will work with PureFlow to kickstart the process, and then PureFlow uh, will, will uh, handle the, the financing piece all on their own. Um, at this time, I'll be happy to try to answer questions. Just let me say how much I've appreciated uh, Ms. Bechtel's work helping us put this together. Also, uh, Ms. Nasher and, and Lauren, we, we've all worked together really quickly to try to put this together. And, and Lauren, I don't know if you'd like to speak to this project or how important it is or anything about PureFlow. We have, um, have been blessed to make, be in the area for the last 20-ish years. Prior to that, we were in Mevin. Um, we call Graham, Alamance County home, um, and we would very much appreciate your support in approving this um, board so that we can get the reimbursement resolution um, established uh, and continue to grow and develop here in our local area. Thank you. Um, as a matter of point, I think because I got you off by reminding you of the DOT gentleman because that changed from the agenda. I don't believe you approved the agenda. So if you wouldn't mind doing that and then we will resume this discussion. Thank you. And that's why we appreciate this lady. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought we did, but maybe yeah. not. Either Steve way, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I'll move for it. That, that was consent. That, yeah, it was moved and seconded. I thought it was and I thought we all voted on it as well. Yeah, we had that for the consent agenda, but not for the actual approval of the okay. agenda. Okay, thank you. Do we have your motion again for the approval of the agenda? Yeah, I said. All right. I'm second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Does that put us back in good standing? Absolutely. Thank awesome. you. <laughs> So, uh, commissioners, the question for the board is to reinstate the authority and to consider appointing this slate of members that would uh, then go and meet on November 8th to further this process for pure flow. So. And the only other item that would come back to the board would be this allows pure flow this option, and they're working through, and there are a lot of confinements, which is why we don't see them a lot. Uh, a lot of configurations that have to happen under the uh, federal tax revenue code to make it worthwhile for a company to use them. It looks like it could work for them. They still have to work through more details, but that resolution by this authority that Alamance County reports and the people you will appoint to have to meet and, and adopt that resolution before the 24th. That, that will not be back in front of you. And then if they determine months down the road that this in fact makes sense for this company, then the only thing to come back in front of you will be um, the, that final approval. But it will be not much of an issue to approve at that point. We'll have all the information. And again, as, as the manager has said, the great thing about these industrial revenue bonds is they benefit the county, the, excuse me, the company in this case tremendously, but they cost the county nothing. Not too much left in this world that costs the county nothing. So exactly. it's good and that was the question I was going to ask. You've already answered it. Thank you. So you just need a motion to approve the resolution? That's correct. I'll make that. Second. Any discussion? Quick question, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Traga, uh, as I understand it, once the authority is created, other companies can benefit from, from this as well if they so choose and so and choose to come before that authority. Is that right? Indeed, and that was part of the reasoning behind some of the um, folks that have been invited to participate in the authority. Hopefully, uh, they'll be able to carry this word back to their cities and to the Chamber of Commerce that this program exists and the authority exists and uh, smaller local companies that are in manufacturing may want to take another look at this uh, opportunity. So, And does the authority have a lifespan? 
right? Yes. It, 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 According it to the blessed. statutes, they are appointed uh, until their predecessor is appointed. Uh, it's just because this board has been in existence for such a long time without needing any action that we you need to appoint these members today. Um, but according to Mary Nash Rusher, because of additional changes in tax codes and things, there is hope that we might see one come forward where this could benefit that company here in Alamance uh, sooner than the time span that has happened between Pure Flow's initial industrial bonds and the ones before you today. And, and these groups uh, that the proposed members represent are ones that we normally partner with on economic development projects also and are established entities in the community. So if one of these individuals were to leave, you know, we, we would be going back to a city or to the chamber to get someone else to serve. So. Therefore, there is no term limit, uh, no term as to longevity. That, that is correct. This is different from most boards where you typically would appoint someone for, say, a three-year term. Right. It is just until they are no longer able to serve and then we need to replace someone. Excellent. That's correct. So we're we appointing a person from a position as opposed to the individual? No, you're appointing the, the, the positions. Uh, if they're not able to serve for some reason, then you would likely go back to that source, right. but you wouldn't have to. It gives you a little more flexibility. So if one of these individuals now serving left the position they're currently in uh, and moved to wherever, then we could then replace them or would they have to resign? Well, they would, they would hopefully send us a formal resignation, but they would be deemed to resign if they're not in the county anymore. They certainly couldn't serve on this board. And then you have the choice as to whether or not you replace the, their predecessor in that particular position or perhaps there's a, another area that you think would be better represented and you could appoint someone from that. That's completely going to be up to you as a board. Do we have a motion? I made it. Do you have a second? Have, have a second. Any further discussion? Being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. I remember you from your previous CPA positions. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Wallington. I assume Ms. Wallington is next. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am Calvetta Wallington, Interim Executive Director of Family View Services. So I really just, I don't plan to be before you long unless there are a lot of questions. Um, I really just wanted to take some time to come before you and give you an update on our supervised visitation, which you all have um, funded through ARC funds and through regular uh, county allotment. So we have been um, trying to find a space, as you all know, the Ivy Building or Petri Building, whichever you want to call it, is still under construction. Um, the furniture <laughs> is 16 to 18 weeks out, um, so we have been trying to find alternatives. Um, we also have contracted with our former supervised visitation coordinator, Jennifer Stillman, who is right here, um, who ran the program from 2012 to 2017. Um, Jennifer has a background in psychology, both undergraduate and um, graduate degree from Liberty University, so she is well versed and well qualified to help us out. Um, the plan is for her um, for her to help us with hiring new staff because um, we will have to essentially build the program from the ground up again, which is which is a good thing. Um, so we have been moving forward trying to find alternative space. Um, we do have um, some opening at the cottage which DSS uses for foster care um, and that sort of thing. We have looked at that space. Um, as a kind of last resort, we could utilize it, but it is not conducive to a therapeutic space for kids for what we want to use it for, I'll put it that way. Um, and it doesn't have two separate entrances, really, which is re really required for domestic violence cases. So we would have the visiting parent come in one entrance and the guardian of the child come in, or children, come in the other entrance. So um, we have reached out to um, Ebenezer, which uh, originally offered their space um, back kind of when we first hit COVID and that sort of thing. 
and the plan is to reach out to some other spaces too that have a good open space including the children's theater I mean the children's museum and we would utilize that for our, our lower risk cases um, any questions around that so it is no longer held at the family justice center no I know when I worked there it was it was an ideal spot so domestic violence has grown so much. Are you really it has, and part of the reason it's not really an ideal spot any longer is because we serve the entire community with this yeah. program, and they aren't necessarily going to be domestic violence related cases. They'll be kind of whatever's ordered by the court. And so, in this space, currently, we in the Family Justice Center, we really want it to be a victim service space. And so that's why it's necessary. One, and we're out of room. <laughs> that's the other thing. We've grown so much. Um, that's the other reason why it's necessary to find a different space. Do you have a feel for when you'll be able to move into the Petrie Center? So furniture, uh, last we heard um, from Director of Department of Social Services, Adrian Day, furniture is 16 to 18 weeks out. Um, so yeah, that's why it's necessary to find an alternate space. Um, we're also in the, um, in the process of writing new job descriptions and things like that and Jennifer will be helping us with hiring the permanent person because Jennifer will only be with us for about six months. Just tell you is it not possible for the county to find uh, at least on a temporary basis furniture? I, I think the building is scheduled to be completed the possibly the end of November is the last word that we heard um, so it could it depends on the needs I'm not sure what type of furniture uh, uh, Family View Service we would need, but we'd be happy to talk about is there something that we could do in the interim that would uh, be conducive to the to the program you want to put on in there. I just like for it to be set. there's such a need. For there your is, services. there is, um, and the plan really is to find alternate spaces. Um, I we have already reached out to Ebenezer. Um, we are waiting for a response. If we don't have one in the next couple of days, I'll reach out to Dr. Covington myself. Um, and so I think we will be able to successfully find alternate spacing while we're waiting on furniture. What kind of furniture are you looking for? So it, um, right now it is the, because we are utilizing the space with DSS, and so they order from a very special place, I don't remember the name of it, that is county approved, and so that's why it's taken so long. And generally in speaking, I know furniture in general, like for personal homes, it is, it is back ordered. So it, that's definitely nothing new. You know, we have a lot of. I'm sorry. We have a lot of really good corporate people here that own furniture stores and whatever. Uh, I'm just not sure that if we reach out, they would not be willing to donate or, or at least help us out. Same thing with office furniture, uh, things of that sort, and business people that are maybe cycling down or refurbishing or something on a temporary basis. So if we can extend a hand out and ask for help, uh, maybe it can happen a lot sooner. Certainly. Well, we're, I think we're looking at some space, which if I'm not mistaken, is fully furnished. But we won't be using all the furniture in it, am I correct? I think so. Uh, I know we haven't gone through that uh, space yet with the Board of Elections, but it, if we can find furniture that's conducive to the program that F um, Family Abuse is going to offer, we'll certainly do that. If what Mr. Carter is... Uh, Reverencing uh, a lot of good furniture in that, that building, and we would uh, acquire that as part of a purchase. So uh, that's a possibility, but we're still in the throes of putting that together. Absolutely. I, I think um, myself and Director of DSS, Adrian Day, we are definitely willing to look at all possibilities. Are you looking at primarily? sofas, chairs, tables? It's kind of a little bit of everything because um, we need, there needs to be storage for, um, I'm going to call them toys, but I mean for, for things for kids to do with their parents. Um, so things like that, places for them to sit, that sort of thing. Yeah, the other thing, just trying to think off the top of my head, which is dangerous. Uh, uh, yeah, we have uh, Alcovets, for example, they do a lot of building and putting things together and so there may be just some nonprofits that are willing to, to build new facilities for particularly toy storage and things of that sort, uh, which might actually be more preferable than something you buy off the store shelf. 
Well, and the fact that it's centered around children, you may even want to talk to the carpentry classes oh, at the sure. high schools because they are always they built on a many buddy benches for me my couple two or three years ago to do some playground stuff. And okay. um, and I would reach out to David Morton and Paul Crotz because any kind of fundraiser I go with their raffle items, their furniture they always oh, yeah. give to put back in the community. And um, this this county's always working together. So Rick Rose has uh Couple of stores too. Mm -hmm. Okay, absolutely. So, Mr. Hager, who, who should? Well, I think the, I see we have uh, Adrian Day on the on the Zoom call. I know Adrian and DSS and Family Abuse will be sharing this space, so it'd probably be best to have a discussion with both DSS and Family Abuse about what the furnishings will look like and make sure that uh, it's going to work for both programs. So, I don't know, Adrian, if you have anything to to add to this conversation about furnishings. I do. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so this is not so the furniture for the Petrie building isn't just um, furniture that you would get from a furniture store. This is hospital grade furniture because um, when you have children uh, in visitation settings, I mean you have children who soil furniture, you have children who um, throw up on furniture, and so it has to be a certain type of fabric that's used in these um, areas. It's the same uh, furniture that we use here in our visitation room. Apparently, of course, we have one visitation room now, and we're going to three visitation rooms in the Ivy Building. And so we order that furniture from FSI. Um, it's a state contract, a county approved contract. So, and, and that's their time frame for us to receive that furniture. Um, I don't know what other alternatives uh, we can we can move the furniture that we have here over there, but of course that's just one room. But but that that is an option. Um, so I, I can answer any questions that uh, anyone might have. Yeah, my point is, it's so desperately needed your services and what you you folks have had, you have provided in the past and will be providing in the near future. We hope. And near is the key word. So uh, we just want you guys back in operation. Uh, you do such a good job. It's I understand. And, and we have been working um, very closely with uh, Calvetta and Jennifer. We met, I, I don't remember if it was last week or week before last, but um, we met, we actually did a walk through. Um, we actually collaborated on the order to make sure that both Family abuse services, their needs were being met with as far as furniture as well as DSS uh, furniture needs were being met. Excellent. Ms. Taygood, would you kind of oversee that? Certainly. Thank you. And we thank you. Absolutely. We thank you. Okay. Mr. Baker. You can say something about Wake Forest. He's a, a Wake Forest Law School grad, by the way. So. Um, an undergrad, and I was at the game this weekend for our beating of Duke, and I was a little upset that we gave them a touchdown. There was no reason for that. Well, they, were, <laughs> they were playing only freshmen. When you <laughs> Wake Forest was at the end. So. <laughs> When you're only good once every 20 years, you really got to make it. <laughs> you really got to make it. So um, this, that's happening. Um, I am here for a reason, not to talk about Wake Forest football. Um, Thank you. <laughs> 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 uh, now, wait a minute. Our county attorney needs to come to our aid here. So <laughs> <for Wake Forest. laughs> no way. <laughs> Uh, so I want to talk about a grant application the Recreation and Parks Department is putting in for some American Rescue Act funds. And this is a little confusing because there is, of course, the county funds that were given from the American Rescue Act, Rescue Act and then there are separate direct grants to communities that are competitively uh, awarded. And so this is from that separate group. It's unrelated to the county funding, but it's a competitive grant process that we're seeking funds for and before I forget I do want to thank uh, David Woody on our Recreation and Parks Commission for coming to support this process today um, but this grant would support our Hall River Trails Towns initiative and that's kind of a mouthful the trail towns the entire concept is let's take advantage of all of the visitors that we already have on the on the Hall River Trail that are hiking the paddling 
just coming to visit, find out how to make those people into economic drivers for our Riverside communities. And we've had success with that model in Sacsayhawk, and more recently in Hall River. Um, of course, the Hall River Trail is not solely responsible for the economic growth in those towns, but it helps. And, and those folks help the trail, and the trail is helping create some economic prosperity in those areas. We want to expand that to our other Riverside communities, um, not just in Alamance County, but all along the Hall River Basin. So this is a joint grant with, um, out with Alamance County, Chatham County, uh, TJ Cog, and PTRC um, to work together on this. The Alamance County is actually not the lead applicant, not the fiscal agent on this um, grant. That's <coughs> TJ Cog, but need your permission to, to cooperate on this initiative with them. Um, so there's no county funding required here, um, but we are seeking $300,000 in, in conjunction with um, Chatham and TJ Cog for all of the things we're doing. Um, and if there's any questions about that, happy to, to answer those. Mr. Baker, as I understand it, the, the primary dollar amount goes to fund an, an individual or uh, a staff member. Can you kind of just tell us what that person would be doing? Yeah. Just so, Right, and it's a little confusing because, so Alamance County was going to do one, Chatham was going to do a separate grant, and the granting agency basically called them, and said, called us and said, hey, figure out how to do this together. Um, so we're kind of mashing up two, two separate needs, and that's just because of we're in different places on our development on the Hall River Trail. Um, we've been doing this a little bit longer than Chatham County, so Chatham County wants to get involved, and they are going to contract out someone really to do some planning and feasibility studies not an individual that's gonna be contract work. We are hoping to hire an individual on, on a temporary basis to really do the on the ground, working with communities on the economic development part. So there's not economic development funding here. We're not giving a bunch of money to businesses or the communities. It's mostly about communication and awareness. Here's how many people we have coming to, to your community on the Harbor River Trail when they get off the river or when they come to hike, these are the services they're looking for. And if we can work together with these towns to find people to offer those services, including outfitters, restaurants, bars, you know, the things that would work well in a recreation environment, um, it'll help the town. So it's really about communication. It's about planning. It's about getting people together. Um, and that's a full-time job, so. And it funds that position for one year? So two years. Two years. Fund that position for two years. Yeah. Um, and there's no, re no requirement that we keep that person on. They're not going to be an Alamance County employee. They'll be a TJ Cog employee. And there's certainly no requirement that that term of employment continues after the grant. Any other questions? All in favor, signify by saying, oh, is there a motion? I'll make a motion. <laughs> motion. Second. I'll take two. I don't care. Right. <laughs> you can be Mr. Carter made the motion. I'll be two. Ms. Thompson, the second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. You know, thank you. Okay, Ms. Rollins. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Let me test this. It's going to work for me. Perfect. So this morning, I'd like to give you a brief update. My first art presentation was so long I can I can never beat that everything's going to be brief afterwards but I would like to remind you of a few things that have, uh, have been mentioned before um, Alamance County has received over 32 million dollars has been allocated that amount we've received half of it in May of 21 and we expect the second tranche may be received a year from that date in May of 22 it's been five months and we're still waiting for final guidance we don't have uh, the US Treasury has not issued their final rulings yet on how the funds can be spent but they've been giving a lot of information there are a lot of trainings and interpretations out there um, but the funds are still expected to be expended by December of 2024 with the caveat that if you have a project that you can commit the funds to by that date, you have additional two years to spend it. So ARP was intended, the federal government's goals for this funds was intended to address the pandemic public health issues and to address the negative economic impact to the communities because of the pandemic. 
They wanted to compensate governments for lost local revenues, and they wanted to make sure that we were aiding low-income areas and populations. There were some funding in this um, legislation that was for longer-term investments in infrastructure, and they were specific that it was water, wastewater, stormwater, and broadband. So that, that was the federal government's intent. And then they gave us guidelines in the legislation for how to spend the funding. So these guidelines haven't changed. These five, we're calling them buckets of um, expenditure categories, are the guidelines for how any project that we want to do as a community needs to fall into one of these buckets. We need to qualify to spend our funding by using the, um, the guidelines that they have provided. The first one was very specific to support public health expenditures for COVID mitigation efforts. It included um, certain health and safety staff, and we have already budgeted some of our ARP funding in this category. The second category was to address the neg negative economic impact caused by the pandemic. So um, that's a, a bucket of, of a category where they do have, what we've mentioned before, they have uh, QCT is a, an area where they consider, the federal government considers low income. It's an automatic area of our, our community where if we spent uh, ARP funds on any project in that community, it would automatically be an, uh, an eligible area. Um, that is an example of how they want us to spend funds in this category. It's not, um, it doesn't prohibit doing other things. The third category is replacing lost revenue. And this category was created for governments that did lose revenue dur during the pandemic. Alamance County is not in that category and we won't be spending in this category unless the legislation changes. The fourth category is premium pay. They wanted to provide premium pay for essential workers who are the people who were frontline, putting their health at risk, and they also mentioned low income. Um, they were looking at, uh, the federal government was looking at those who kept coming to work during the pandemic to provide essential services. They've given us some very specific guidelines on who those people are. And the last category is the infrastructure investments. The federal government mentions water, sewer, and broadband. And I keep emphasizing the federal government because we will circle back and talk about the state as well. Um, the only other thing that is new that I wanted to mention is that there is a Senate Bill 3011 that was passed uh, by the U.S. Senate last week. It's being considered by the House of Representatives and it would change, it would allow more flexibility in how we spend the ARP funding. There were three categories that affected Alamance County. One of the categories, um, I had mentioned that Alamance County did not lose revenue during the pandemic, but this legislation would allow us to spend up to $10 million in our ARP funding as if we had. The categories, the, the, the rules around revenue replacement were much more, um, much more flexible about spending and uh, this uh, would change the, the maximum to $10 million of our allocation would be allowed to be spent in that category. Another change that this legislation proposed is to allow up to 30% of our allocation or $10 million, whichever is higher, to be used for infrastructure related activities. And they gave um, very specific parameters around this. Once again, the federal government would want us to spend on infrastructure that fits into an established uh, infrastructure program, such as the CDBG or other established federal programs. If we have projects that fall under those typical guidelines that the federal government has in place, and they gave a long list of what those, um, those programs are that they would allow, but if we had programs that are projects that fell into those kind of categories, we could spend up to 10 million or 30% of our allocation. And the third thing that changed was that we could spend ARP funding for emergency relief. So if there was a natural disaster, such as flooding or anything else that is considered a natural disaster, uh, the legislation would um, allow us to spend all of our funds to mitigate and to provide economic um, response in that category. Emergency housing, food assistance, financial assistance, other immediate needs in a natural disaster situation. 
<coughs> Excuse me. So I did mention that there are state parameters, and I wanted to share this visual. This is something that the um, School of Government folks have been sharing, and it's um, it's a really good visual because the ARP funding is in all of the categories that you see in this pyramid. Um, the local government, facilities, operations, and personnel, community programs and public infrastructure. We can spend ARP funds on households and individuals, travel tourism industry, and small businesses and nonprofits, and also broadband. The federal government gives funding uh, uh, for all of those categories. The state of North Carolina has limited, has always limited what um, counties and municipalities can do. So in this visual, the broadest authority in the state of North Carolina is at that bottom level, the local government facilities, things that we already do that the state of North Carolina legislation uh, expects us to do, ARP is, the, uh, is an easy way for us to spend ARP on that. Whereas the state of North Carolina makes it very, it, it's much more limited what a municipality or a county can do for broadband. Even though ARP allows it, there's very narrow state authority. So they have categorized this, and I just wanted to share the visual for folks who have questions, because uh, when we're looking at projects, some of them are going to be easier to use ARP funds than others. Would an example of that be that we have a gray area there, small business and nonprofits, we're not allowed to grant. We can contribute to the small business loan program Correct. that we did previously. We small business loan program is um, it, it, the parameters around that have been uh, at the state level are very specific, and it's even though ARC would allow it, the state law is what has been uh, limiting our ability to, to do much. And we don't have an existing utilities operation within the county, so we can't do broadband. Yeah, the broadband, I, I defer to um, Bruce and those who've been following that closely because the broadband legislation is difficult for me to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of it. Um, sir, you're correct. Yeah, there's a lot of restriction there. And, you know, yes, if you had your own infrastructure in place, you could do that. And there's a few towns that have attempted to do that, and then they were told they couldn't do that. And so there's a lot of restrictions there. Now, there's been a question about whether or not we could help municipalities with some of our county funding since they have the infrastructure for broadband but then theirs is confined typically to their footprint their, their city footprint so that it wouldn't get out into the county it wouldn't be benefiting the people we really need to be able to help correct and they're also receiving their own that's own right money. so this is another visual that I wanted to make sure that we shared on the left hand side you'll see that there's a uh, circle, the orange circle, is the federal legislation on what is eligible for ARP spending. Thank you. And then on the right hand side, the blue circle, is what state law allows um, counties and municipalities to do. And we have to be in the, uh, the gray area. It has to be ARP eligible, it has to be state allowed. Um, that's important. On the right hand side, you'll see a light green federal law compliance. So this is all of the U.S. Treasury guidelines and other federal guidelines for federal spending, such as the CDBG projects or any of those other, um, uh, the, the purchasing law for federal programs would be in this light green circle. And on the right would be the state law compliance, which are, a lot of them are the same, but some of them are different. We have to do all of them. So if we are to spend ARP funding, we not only have to do all of the state law compliance, for purchasing processes and for every other process, but we also have to do the federal. So this is important because agencies that we have worked with in the past will be asked to do different things now. If we are using ARP for a project, we may have to go through a different competitive bid process. We may have to go through additional paperwork, contracts, uh, legal team might be involved, where in the past they might not. So that was important for us to share with these, these nonprofits and other agencies, the community, you may want to come up with programs that are um, new that we would want to spend ARP on. And I also wanted to share one more slide because this was a really good example. We've been attending coursework and um, getting some guidance from various agencies. And this was a really good slide that the School of Government put together to explain the thought process behind is ARP a good funding source for a project? And they chose a project that was uh, 
they said, can we repave a, a city-owned walking trail? And I changed it to say county-owned. The question there, the reason they chose this example, hopefully it's a very typical thing for people to ask. Um, it's important that the state allows us to do it, and we are allowed to have walking trails. We are allowed to spend money on them from the state level. And it was important um, that it be county-owned rather than privately owned. There are so many restrictions on us spending any money on something that is not uh, public. So for this particular, sorry, ah, thank you. For this particular question, my first assumption was would be a walking trail helps your your health, so it should fall in the public health category. But it didn't. Um, it, it didn't fall in public health category because it wasn't mitigating the pandemic. It wasn't mitigating the public health pandemic. It wasn't a response. So they looked at um, taking it to the economic impact category. So those who are most negatively impacted by the pandemic are usually those who are low income that would rely on the public process, the, the public walking trails. They wouldn't be going to their private gyms to, to get healthy after the pandemic. So the first question here was, is a walking trail in a qualified census tract? If it were in the QCT, then that would make it naturally allowable according to the US Treasury guidance, preliminary guidance that we have. But what if it's not? The second question you would ask, would repaving this project primarily benefit low-income citizens or those who were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic? So if they're low income, it's assumed that they were disproportionately impacted. If they're not low income, if it's just your general public, we would do something else to determine that they were disproportionately impacted. Um, but if we couldn't do that, then the last question would be, is repaving necess necessitated by the increased use because of the pandemic? So if our walking trails were worn out because everyone was outside during the pandemic and we can make that case, it may be that ARP funding would be avail available. So you see the thought process there is you're going through a decision tree on, on a project, even within one of these categories. Multiple categories may be eligible. So in this case, she said if, if, if that first category doesn't work for your particular project, look at um, replacing lost revenue. Well, Alamance County doesn't have lost revenue, so we wouldn't be spending in this category. But then it was significant that they said can you use your ARP funding on some other eligible expenditure in order to supplant local government funds and use it for this project? So that was a decision process that they are teaching at the school of government level to give an example for how you would go through a decision on every single project that you want to spend ARP funding for. So I share that because we're starting to do that with the things that have already been approved by the board. We have to document. We will be doing regular reports. There are progress reports on have you achieved what you, you intended to achieve, what have you spent, and we have to submit a lot of documentation for that. So we're working up in the background what it takes to meet the federal government requirements on each of these. But it helps to have this first decision tree for every project clear so that we know which of the um, categories that we're in and we know what documentation to provide. So all of the agencies that you see on this final slide are participating in training. They are advocating for local uh, interests and they are um, working up materials. This, all of these slides came from one or more of the uh, presentations that they have provided. And um, we do have recorded webinars and presentations available on various topics. So. If, uh, for those who might be interested in stormwater projects, there are two or three resources that we have that we can share. For those who might be interested in broadband, there are other resources. So there are uh, a lot of um, professionals who are looking at specific pieces of this legislation in order to provide more guidance. And we um, would need to know where we're going with the, the local funds in order to tap into the right resources. And if there are questions, we can find the answers. Thank you so much. Thank you. I know you have a large job. And Mr. Hayden.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I'd just like to say how much I appreciate Andrea and her team. They attend every webinar. They sit through every school of government class, classes and uh, information put out by the Association of County Commissioners and the League of Municipalities. They are involved in all of it, even tracking this legislation in Washington to try to make sure we're staying on top of um, what ARP is up to and how we can spend it. And it, you know, that is on top of monitoring our capital plan, monitoring our finances, monitoring our budget. It's a, it's an added piece of what we're doing, but uh, we are really fortunate to have a group of folks that are paying close attention to it. And what I hope will happen is the folks that are coming on the 10th of November, the board has set a special meeting, and that was part of the reasoning behind Andrew's presentation this morning, is to put that presentation on the county's website as well as they can watch the, the recording of this as nonprofits uh, or other community groups start thinking about coming on the 10th with their presentations. Hopefully this will be helpful, helpful to them and they can get some uh, good, uh, good ideas about uh, how, to, how to frame or think about their project. So um, as I said, the, the commissioners have set a, uh, a meeting date for November the 10th at 6 o'clock for the community to come and present information to the commissioners about what they would like to see the county consider to do with our art plans. And if that, I thought it would be appropriate uh, to go ahead at this point and to uh, go over with the commissioners and the general public what we have seen thus far uh, from county government in particular. Um, so this is a repeat. We spent a lot of time reminding the board and the public. We've been allocated almost $33 million uh, for, uh, to Alamance County from ARC. We've received, as Andrea mentioned, about half of that due to receive the balance uh, next May. And once we realize the dollar amount we were going to receive that this was a real uh, a real program our office started working with county departments and partner nonprofits we have some very close-knit nonprofits through particularly through uh, health and DSS uh, we started working with them to say okay you know, we're, if we're going to the county's going to receive 32 million dollars and have to be thinking about how to spend those funds give us some ideas of needs or project uh, potential projects uh, for the board to consider and to be thinking about those costs extended over the three-year arc uh, period. Um, so what you're going to see today, though, is really county government, right? We've, we've, we've taken the nonprofit piece out. The reason we did that was because they're coming on the 10th, okay? So the information I'll present you today is tied to a county department, uh, identified need in some form or fashion, not nonprofits. Um, so this will only be about county government uh, uh, info today. And it is important to remember that the commissioners have already approved spending a little over a million dollars on uh, mental health agencies, as uh, Calvetta mentioned. Some of that funding went to Family Abuse Services. Some equipment uh, related specifically to the um, county's attempt to deal with COVID and three new positions at county government. The board also has approved $3.8 million to spend uh, for that March to June time period. This kind of goes to what Andrew was talking about on the slide where school of government suggests you may want to consider supplanting funds right with ARP dollars to free up so that, that 3.8 million we're not spending it it's designated it can be spent on ARP type projects if, if you would like to do that and we've also the commissioners also approved 1.7 million in ARP funding to spend at the human service center for the HVAC project in lieu of debt for that project uh, the board voted to spend ARP so we have 26.3 million dollars in ARP funding remaining but uh, it's, it, it could be 30.1 if the commissioners want to use that 3.8 designated uh, to spend toward ARP type projects. Right? So at this point, I'm going to just begin talking about uh, the county government identified uh, ways to spend ARP that the board can consider. Please know that many of these price and costs are estimates. Some of it uh, may not be 100% ARP eligible. If the board were to say we want to pursue this particular expenditure, we're going to have to start applying Andrea and her team's methods to make sure it's legitimate. And as we go through that, we may find that some portion of one of these projects is not 100%. But we haven't done that to, to the level of the slides that Andrea has shown because we really kind of want the board to give us some direction to say we like that or we want to hear more from the public on the tent. So at this point, uh, we have major categories of the county's identified possible ways to spend ARP. Ongoing public health and safety pandemic response, a little over $17 million potential. Response to mental health needs uh, due to the pandemic, $23.6 million. Uh, mitigating the economic impact, $3 million. We've identified $900,000 in potential water and sewer projects. 
and a little over $3.3 million for broadband projects. So county, county departments, including county management, right, have identified $48.1 million in potential ways to spend our money. Remember, we, we only have 32, 32 million, but again, understand that the commissioners will be making these decisions and hopefully you'll take all this uh, information into account as you hear about what counties identified and then again on the 10th uh, from the from the citizenry and from nonprofits. So for the ongoing public health and safety response, I'm going to briefly go through this. I'm happy to answer any questions as I go uh, and would certainly call on, uh, on staff's assistance with this. Public health and immunization at $1.8 million. This is what we're currently spending at the health department in particular that's funded by FEMA. What we're a little bit to fight COVID for vaccinations and all the costs that the, the COVID response has to county government. We're starting to see that FEMA is drawing down on what they will pay for because FEMA knows local governments have received ARP, right? So they're kind of backing off. So what we're saying is if we're going to look the next two to three years out, we're not sure how long we'll be dealing with COVID, how long we'll be doing uh, immunizations or having clinics or any other related costs uh, through health. We're estimating $1.8 million as potential to earmark to spend uh, for that program, particularly if FEMA uh, pulls completely back. We've also identified almost $6 million in compensation across county government. Uh, part of this is for the EFMLA that the board has approved. This is where employees go out either quarantined with COVID or have they been contact traced with COVID and they're able to take COVID leave, not their own uh, personal vacation or sick. And this is also uh, what we have identified in a very high level overview of county government spending for salaries and overtime that the board could authorize or earmark. This would be part of that supplant mechanism to try to bring funding back. You spend ARP on these ARP identified costs. This could be part of uh, supplanting for other uses. Then the elections, we're estimating uh, 370000 plus dollars uh, to, to keep Kathy's group ready for the next election with all their social distancing uh, and equipment requirements. And the detention center, uh, as, you, as the board knows, we've had multiple outbreaks in detention. Every time we have an outbreak, it costs us a significant amount of money to clean and test. We're currently testing all inmates, working with the sheriff's department to make sure inmates are um, brought in and kept separate from general population. Uh, and so we're recommending that the board consider $910,000 to earmark that in the event COVID is going to continue to be a problem for detention. So much of this is if COVID is going to continue to be addressed by county government, these are costs you may want to consider earmarking. We may or may not spend them, but they would be there earmarked, ready to spend if COVID response continues to go on multi-year. With the exception of the compensation piece, we feel like that would be uh, a, an expenditure that's definitely going to happen, but could serve as adding to the designated funding that you've already done once. We also uh, are recommending the board consider earmarking some ARP dollars for the court system. We have worked very closely with courts, paying folks to do the screening processes to try to make sure court stays safe and continues and avoids backlogs. Um, we're paying for some of this with FEMA. Again, we feel like it's possible FEMA's going to start pulling back now that ARP has been distributed to local governments, so commissioners may want to consider earmarking ARP funding uh, to continue to put at the disposal of court if needed. The emergency management, uh, emergency management office has suggested a uh, new position in EM, an EM planner for three years. Uh, EM has been extremely busy, and we've been in a state of emergency since I think last February or March. So uh, uh, EM is suggesting we could consider adding another person to their, to their department. Uh, then we also have uh, premium pay. You saw that that was one of the buckets that uh, ARC allows uh, the county to spend funding on. We've earmarked $3 million. That could be for bonuses for uh, in-person county staff that have been frontline, the frontline troops. Could also pay for uh, raises if the board so wanted to do that for specific uh, individuals understanding that these would be ARP dollars and would expire in three years. So we the did fight. raises that expired in three years. Are we saying that those people then would we would lose that money after the third year unless we wanted to put it in the budget from the taxes revenue? I think the only way I would suggest the board use the pay, uh, premium pay for uh, employee raises is you'd be you would be ready to assume that raise after the end of ARP. Uh, it would be difficult to go back to the employees and try to reduce their pay. It could be done, but um, 
I think either bonuses is, is one option. Uh, local governments are looking at using raises are another possible way uh, uh, to do that. But again, just at the end of the ARC funding, any raise that had been set, it would probably be best to consider the county dollars stepping in after the final year of ARC to pick it up. And there are a number of criteria with premium pay. I think uh, there was some restrictions about employees teleworking. So it really, it, the federal guidance really tries to hone in on the frontline folks that were very much responsible for the county's uh, COVID response, either past or, or going on now. Uh, the final piece for ongoing public health safety response, we've looked at uh, a number of ways to make limited capital improvements. The commissioners know that uh, the ways to spend ARP on capital are very limited, but we have looked at how might that be done. We've estimated, uh, again, uh, high level estimate, a little over $3 million. And these include uh, activities like installing a new parking lot over at the HSC. Uh, we've, we've got our immunization clinics running over there right now, so that's taking up a great deal of parking. We've lost uh, parking spaces for DSS and health regular staff and for citizens. And some ventilation projects at EMS. We've also, the commissioners know we've got two very large capital projects coming up uh, in the near future, the construction of the new court admin building, J.B. Allen renovation, as well as civil court and the county office building eventual uh, renovation to make this all county office building. While we know that uh, ARC cannot be used to pay for that in its entirety at this point, right, with the current guidance we couldn't, we felt like it was safe to estimate 10% of those costs. We could try to figure out how to make that ARP eligible. That could be for HVAC work. Right. Uh, if, we're, if we're paying for design and planning that's going to help the buildings be more socially distance, distant uh, and socially safe, so we've estimated 10% of the total cost of both. That's 1.3 million and about half a million dollars. Some tax renovation, tax department renovation work and also some renovations over at the Human Service Center and some space planning over there. Libraries and inspections. Uh, also some HVAC work at Eli Whitney and Pleasant Grove and the Open Door Clinic that will be vacated once the Petrie Building is complete and Open Door Clinic moves out. So these are all capital projects that we feel like would be qualified uh, for ARP spending in some form or fashion. If, 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 any of, if we choose to do any of these with ARP money, we would really have to get down into the weeds to make sure we could, we could qualify uh, the spending on these, on these buildings. Brian, please forgive me for interrupting you, but the Community Center Project for Ventilation at Eli Whitney and Pleasant Grove, can I just ask Brian Baker to elaborate on what that is exactly for? Sure. Sure, that would be to uh, get these buildings ready for the next pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we use those through, throughout this pandemic for vaccine distribution, for testing. They were usable, but not great. They don't have air conditioning in either one of those locations. There's really no indoor space to be used, so we were have to do all that in the parking lot. Um, so a lot of these funds were geared towards getting our community ready for the next pandemic, and I think that would be a good investment. So possibly a thing had to be used for emergency shelters as well. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. So obviously, capital spending is limited. We've tried to find uh, ways that if we were going to make improvements to our buildings, they would fit within the ARC criteria. This is the largest, the largest potential uh, expenditure of the county's ARC funds. This is to uh, respond to mental health needs that have been uh, brought to light due to the pandemic. $23.6 million potential spending here. The Diversion Center, I know the commissioners are very familiar with this project, but we've been working on this with RHA and our uh, Justice Advisory Council and stepping up in the Sheriff's Department for a number of years. Uh, we're suggesting the commissioners could consider earmarking up to $13.2 million. So the Diversion Center uh, with VIA, we have now have VIA uh, with us, and they've looked at our model of, uh, which was Based on where we currently are, we're, we currently have a diversion center located on Anne Elizabeth Drive, seven days a week. I believe it's, uh, it's eight hours a day. Uh, VIA and uh, RHA have worked together to, to put together a, a new model of what the diversion center could be, and that would be a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week facility that would also uh, include 16 beds. So there would be bed space in the building for individuals to stay there longer than the 23-hour chairs. Our original model, before we had access to ARP funding, was 
very, very, very small scale, 23 hour chair, low level. Good, important, uh, useful. This this model is is far above that. Let's tell you, what is a 23 hour chair? <laughs> there, there are, uh, so uh, at a, a behavioral health uh, center like um, RHA currently runs, there are statutes that limit how long someone can stay in that facility if it's not at this uh, uh, expanded yes at this new model level if they can have a chair they can't have a bed they can stay there in that chair or in the vicinity of that chair for up to 23 hours <laughs> then they have to be that person then has to be relocated <laughs> okay. and the thing the is, it is, is, is if you can't find a spot for them you're really in trouble because 23 hours seems like 23 days when you're looking for beds in this everywhere they're not just out there waiting to receive people it is very difficult to find somewhere to put someone be a comfortable chair. So we've, we've worked with RHA and VIA to come up with this potential budget for the Diversion Center. Uh, we would be looking at ARC funding at the uh, amount of $11.3 million a year for three years. And then we would budget a, a little over $1.8 million of county ARC funding to try to put toward the capital cost because that, that 11.3 includes operating, which also includes facility costs. That could be lease or debt depends on you know where we like on where we want to have this facility but uh, anything we can put toward the capital cost that we had talked about perhaps the county's dollars could be used to offset cost of water sewer HVAC similar to what we've looked at in some of our other buildings uh, and we would also use we still have Cardinals 1.2 million dollars that they gave us several years ago it's one-time grant uh, to be used for capital for a new diversion center and we hopefully will have some Petrie funding left uh, Mr. Petrie had agreed when he made his donation for the construction of the uh, Petrie building, any funding that was left could be put toward the capital cost of the new diversion center. I think the one thing to take away, this is an estimate, $13.2 million. If the commissioners decide that the, the diversion center is a definite uh, uh, project that you would like us to spend more time uh, diving into, then we're going to try to drill down on those operating cost estimates. And we are also, with this model, we're estimating that at the end of the ARC funding, the county would be looking at having to come up with two, a little over $2 million a year in addition to our own funding that we already spend on uh, diversion. We currently spend maintenance of effort funding in the amount of a little over a million dollars. Uh, so we would have to come up with an additional 2.1. And, and that 2.1 includes our uh, opioid settlement. We've, I think we have estimated our opioid settlement dollars might be around 380000 after uh, attorney fees are taken from that for I think it's 18 years so we have included that now that may or may not happen there may be other ideas about what to do with opioid settlement but if you put all the county's opioid settlement all the county's maintenance of effort money uh, we would still need to come up with about two million dollars and if if the commissioners decide this is a way to go diversion center is of interest then we're going to spend a lot of time trying to come up with a model that lowers that 2.1 million dollars that would be ideal how do we do that and make it to where at the end of the day our funding is gone uh, that that two million dollars is something that we can we can um, live with easier and, and I just kept I don't tell you I forget no it's okay during please. our steering committee meeting um, with um, Donald Bruce he came down for Baya to have a great team meeting with us with the the leads and that was a much smaller group than Jack and um, the goal is this place is very close to the hospital is to get the hospital to buy in as well because that's going to really alleviate what is sitting in the emergency rooms waiting and once once law enforcement brings them to the emergency rooms they do not leave then they have to stay there if they bring them to the diversion center they can leave them with that because it's it's just geared and estimated to do all that so you're looking at more funding probably as far as the hospital because that's a great collaboration and plus the fact that we're going to take such a burden off of their ER. So it's something to really consider. I think that's a wonderful comment, and I think Mr. Turner's addressed that issue as well. My concern there is uh, if uh, HRA or Cone, you know, either of them pull out and we don't fully control the facility, uh, then we're, we're in a lot of trouble. Well, I would always think that if you go into something like this, you got to own it yourself before you expect anybody else to come in. But I, I don't answer for Mark at ARMC, but I think this would be a godsend to what they face every day in that ER room. I totally agree. I think the diversion center is a major emphasis. 
and you can stay what they say seven to ten days yes. the 23 hour chair is not even considered here I mean this is 16 beds and we've talked to RTSA I mean it's gonna really pull so many providers that we have in the county that sometimes you don't even know about to really work with them as well um, because right now you have shortage of beds because when we did the recovery court went down to see that I mean it's everywhere trying to find a location for folks and close by home is always the most effective for family support <coughs> children that kind of thing if this thing is done correctly it will help the sheriff's department uh, should help their budget with reduced beds and things of that sort so we're pulling money from all kinds of sources uh, with the diversion center I think is a high priority for the sheriff and his department. Uh, it certainly is for social services, uh, likely for mental health. I see uh, our health director on the back row and he's, I think he was shaking his head, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, I just think it's a top priority. And you just think if you've got officers that have to stay in the ER with these people as long as until whatever happens is going to happen, that pulls that much more off the field where you could be on patrol or wherever else. Well, I can speak to to a couple of recent situations at the emergency room, 14 to 15 hour wait times uh, because there weren't enough beds in the emergency room. Taking some of that pressure off there would pro probably improve that significantly. And we're talking about law enforcement sitting there That's for right. those hours. So there, there's, there is no disputing the value of the diversion center programs for the community. Absolutely not. The county is currently investing in that. It's a, it's a limited model. Uh, uh, over on Mount Elizabeth Drive, seven days a week, limited hours, and limited services. But we're, we're, not all counties have this uh, facility-based crisis in their county, and this has been important to county residents for a long time. So we're, we're funding it. It, it. it works at Mount Elizabeth Drive. We had looked at a enhanced model that would uh, originally was going to move to elderly services, right, and use the cardinal money to put it in elderly services, but it would be very, it was going to be very similar to the model at Anna Elizabeth Drive, just larger, some other nonprofits that help with mental health services could be in there. I think it was gonna, uh, Elderly Services was gonna have a little bit more room, but this model is, is much beyond that. I mean, the only reason we're really discussing it is because of the availability of our funds. If the commissioners want to pursue this particular project, we would have to work hard to figure out, make sure it's all eligible, and then how do you do it that puts the county in a place when the art funds are gone that it's as little impact as possible to the general fund budget. That would be the key the key piece of it. I think BIA would be able to help us do that. Um, you know, we, we need their help to, to try to help us figure out how they're billing and how they'd be able to work with RHA to try to increase revenue besides the county dollars too. But. And just to add to that, because like I said, I forget, um, we saw the building plans, which were just phenomenal, and the young, the youth building is a totally separate unit. It's all together, but it's, there's no way you can go, you can walk down the hall if you're an adult. They're for ultimate safety purposes, everything like that. And when we need to understand that eight, under 18, there are a lot of problems. You're starting to see drug addiction in the younger people as well. Um, JCPC with Exchange Club has now got a substance abuse program for that population. Um, it all adds together with your crime and everything else and it's just hit it's clobbering our young people and we have got to intervene in that or their future's not looking too good. Well did you get a, a number from Cone and what they might be willing to contribute? No. Did that come up at all? No, we just talked about the possibility of pulling them in and um, the location aspect oh. instead of on the other location is ultimately time consuming it's just so economical and the fact that we're right there at it um the diversion going to that emergency room unless there's physical injuries would be right there at that no i am not volunteering this hospital i'll just send them a note <laughs> <laughs> send me a check <laughs> no I, not hardly I yes May I share? absolutely um this this project is a really good example of um various funding sources being available, various partners being available, a lot of decisions that can be made that they intertwine. Right. So you wouldn't want to make a partnership decision independent of a financial decision. So I share that with you because um, it's impossible to actually determine if we can use ARP independent of all of those other conversations. 
And then this particular project, there are six or seven different resources that could be tapped. Um, but I would share with you that the guidance from ARP talks about uh, mental health services in particular because of the state's uh, LME process. Because we have these local management entities like BIA that uh, should be our partners, um, the state uh, rules around using ARP are going to intertwine with that process. So it's, um, BIA needs to be at the table even if uh, Cone Health or other uh, partners right. are out there. It's um, going to be easier to use federal and state funding with that kind of a process. Whereas if you did something slightly different, you would look for other funding sources. Yeah, BIA was definitely, I saw as the lead in this because they've got experience in developing and creating diversion centers and that's, you want the person that's done this path before because there's been so much work done for the Jack committee and the steering committee and um, they're at the next level of having to go across the bridge to where we're digging dirt now so to speak and Vaya has got vast experience and they're very very committed so we're very blessed to have them and we'll have them putting money into the project obviously mm -hmm. yes yeah, so it'll be really important that Vaya works with the provider like RHA to make sure they can bill appropriately because uh, you know the more that RHA can bill through Via to the state, uh, the, that will help cover the cost of the facility. So, you know, if uh, Via has been very, uh, they've been at the table the whole time. In fact, they uh, really kind of uh, were key to thinking about this this model where you know the multiple beds and, and a more enhanced model than uh, our original. And HRA is heavily involved. Yes. In the input, Chief Deputy Parker, do you want to address the diversion center? Do you want to say anything about it from the? Sheriff's Department standpoint? Uh, just, I think you mentioned earlier, uh, the board did the, the sheriff's uh, uh, commitment to this along with the stepping up committee. So, and Thank knowing you. the impact it would have in the detention centers. Thank you. And that definitely shows that this, we just don't have issues mm -hmm. with drug abuse and mental health. We have crisis and we need some world that can be treated. And uh, very well. So we'll move on to our next. This is a uh, second uh, larger project, Veterans Community Project. Uh, we're saying the commissioners could consider earmarking up to $8 million for this project. It's important to understand uh, that these were figures that we got from the Veterans Community Project that uh, we thought this would be an ARP eligible program. It's not necessarily that the commissioners would have to earmark this uh, specific dollar amount, but these were the costs that the folks with BCP estimated it would take. Uh, to construct their facility in Alabama County, roughly $5 million, and that's to provide facility for uh, veterans in need of housing as well as their service center. And then the uh, estimated cost of operation was $1.5 million. So we said, okay, if the commissioners were interested in using ARP dollars to fund Veterans Community Project at some level, what would be the max the commissioners could put in if, chose, if you choose to do so over the three-year ARP period, and we're estimating that to be $8 million. That's uh, the $5 million cost to construct and two years of operations. Um, again, very, very impressive program. Uh, attended the uh, overview with Commissioner Thompson in Kansas City. Uh, there's no, uh, we're already, uh, I know the board has heard this too. We've had numerous folks from the community uh, interested in this. I think we've received some donations or uh, already to go toward this project. People are interested in it. So uh, it's a good, good quality project, it has a mental health uh, uh, angle to it uh, due to the fact that many of the veterans that would be taken advantage of it are going to have mental health challenges in some form or fashion. Too. How does that enter into the Alco Vets program? So I know Alco Vets, when, when we toured with uh, Can the folks with Kansas City, one of the things they said that was critical for their success in a community is to come into the community and meet with all of these groups like Alco Vets, your foreign legions, uh, uh, your American legions, your veterans of foreign wars, everybody in the area that provides service to veterans, uh, the Veterans Community Project staff felt like it was important to meet with them to make sure it's clear there's no competition here and to get an idea of the lay of the land. What's, what is in place in Alamance County or wherever they go and how would what Veterans Community Project offers dovetail with services that are already here. So I know uh, Alco Vets working hard down on Cane Mountain, installing a retreat center uh, that would allow veterans to come down to the mountain and uh, go through different types of uh, uh, mental health programming or stay and just enjoy nature. Uh, they're very excited because it's um, 
next to our newest park at Cane Mountain Natural Area. So uh, there's they, uh, one, the folks from Alco Vets that I've spoken to felt like it was tremendous potential and having access for these vets to be able to get right to the park, hike and see, uh, see nature and have some organized programs for them that would be organized at the uh, Cane Mountain Alco Vet facility but then take advantage of, of the natural area too. So that was much more uh, temporary too and from a housing perspective it wasn't intended to be long term. That's a vacation spot basically yeah. for a veteran to get away. Um, this is housing. Um, they said usually their longest their average stays are 10 to 14 months but they do not push anybody out until they're ready to the next level. I know uh, when we talked to Donald Roos from Valle about this he mentioned a veterans group in North Carolina that would probably be a big support for us as well. I've talked to Corey Spore who was Mark Congressman Mark Walker's uh, veterans liaison whatever and I'm talking to him constantly about um, he works for the veterans place that gets men housing he said I've already got eight veterans that I, I need housing for so this is a, um, a, a very I, I can't I can't I remember Craig said if you're gonna do this do this right this is as right as it gets the way every I, every detail is planned but the thing of it is is um, We've represented several veterans who have come back and have, it's like Corey told me, you never come back from deployment the way you go to deployment and we all know that. And we all sit here and have all these freedoms to just sit here and talk about this when we've got men and women that don't come back the same, they may not physically look the same or they may not come back at all. And um, we've got to do something for our veterans. They seem like they always, we just kind of find a little place for them or we do this for them. I think we need to really show our veterans what we mean business for getting their lives back and getting them back into the work field and it does it covers a veteran in every angle I've never seen anything like this place uh, but it is something we need to really think about because um, if you serve this country and, and you make it through that war and you come back any kind of different than what you went to it and you know we had a veteran we we represented it did the very same thing in the army that my son did he was Bradley heavy armor vehicles and um, his mother was very sick and when he got out of the army he had to quit his job to take care of her and he went to the store to get her something and when he come back the house was in flames and he saved her life and got her out but she later died two days later from smoke inhalation and it flattened him and he got a, a bad drug habit and was found on the bench somewhere sleeping in a park and was arrested and um, and he's perfect candidate for this to get his life back on track because they have three veterans per case manager. They don't have 10 to 15. You know that that person is on call for you. I've never, I wish every situation, no matter what, other than just veterans as well, could have this kind of treatment. But um, when we saw what we saw, and to be one of eight only in the United States of America, talk about something that our county and our state could be proud of, and just to see this in person, every flag was hanging outside those, those homes, every sidewalk. It's, it's just the best. It's a red carpet for soldiers. And uh, I just really hope we can consider doing this. They're gonna, they were coming the 17th, 18th, and 19th of November, but Ben, I think he's over there construction, was, it's not gonna be able to come then, so hopefully they'll be here in December. But I'll tell you, they don't just come here and say, here you go. You got to really prove to them that you're going to make this and have sustainability, and you got longevity in this because all they care about is that soldier, and um, they they'll bring their finances, their fundraisers, their court, everything, and to meet with all the folks that Brian was talking about in this commissioner board, anybody else that wants to have input in this to be a support system, because I've had contractors say I'll build you a house. I mean, it's something so different, but yet so needed and so important. In this one time, there's going to be a spotlight shining on the the soldier that needed it. So, uh, you know where my heart is. I, I'm the biggest fan. I want everybody to understand they're very distinctly different groups. Uh, Alabama County Veterans, Alco Vets, yeah. is a nonprofit and they're operating on their own and they have not asked for county monies. Uh, this group is also a nonprofit out of is it Kansas? Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, and is also a separate nonprofit. Um, and my one of the questions I had, of course, is uh, are the veteran services, is that a federal obligation, a state obligation, or is it really an Alamance County? Can we afford to be uh, obligated to supporting all the veterans when it's really a federal obligation? Um, just, a, just a question. 
I see that we have Sheriff Johnson here, and I asked uh, Chief Deputy <coughs> Parker if he had any comments on the Diversion Center, uh, and he said, if you, do you want to say anything in regards to the Diversion Center? I say it needs to be opened right now today, if that <laughs> answers your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, a quick question for Mr. Um, the Veterans Community Project, the, the one-time facility cost of $5 million and the operation cost of $1.5 a year for two years, are those the total costs? Yes, they are. And, and let me make it make sure it's clear to the board. Uh, Veterans Community Project is very clear. They, they work hard to be sustainable. They're very interested in our corporate neighborhood in Alamance County and how they would fit into it. So this would be... Uh, this is just to give the commissioners an idea of if the commissioners wanted to allocate ARP dollars, this would probably be the maximum amount based on the budget that we've heard from them thus far. So, um, and in other places, do, do they put up the facilities themselves? I think my understanding it's uh, uh, de depends on what town they're in, but I, I don't I don't want to communicate to the commissioners that Veterans Community Project. Is expecting for the commissioners to fund this in its entirety either way uh, I think if the commissioners want to spend our dollars on this this would be the max and uh, but I think they're gonna make their decisions based on um, community support yeah. the need uh, and sustainability so I've talked numerous times at council meetings about leveraging county dollars mm -hmm. for, for some of these, these projects to make county dollars go farther I think these these two may be perfect examples where if we do this right, we can partner with both public and private partners so that the county can provide a piece so that it benefits the citizens of the county, but but it also incentivizes our partners to put in some themselves because they are also going to benefit long term if these are done correctly. So I'm looking for projects where we can we can leverage county dollars to, to increase the, the greater pot. In the community buy-in they have, I just encourage you to go to their website, is unbelievable. I, I've never seen anything like They're already expanding. They're going to be on probably the next block because of uh, the sport. Kansas City Chiefs come there and help paint buildings. And uh, Corey said, I know the, what do you call them down there, the Panthers? I didn't mean that like disrespectful, I'm Tom Brady. But I'm just saying, um, there's all kind of <laughs> hookups that Corey knows for us. Corey's already wanting to build one. It's amazing because this is so exciting, if, you know, like yourself, Craig, to see um, our fellow soldiers be cared for after they come home and they don't have one. I'm going to go ahead and move, move forward, Commissioners. Uh, we also had under the mental health banner uh, for park fund uh, spending potential, we have new court service programs that have been. Uh, brought to our attention as po uh, possible ways to spend our dollars, a little over $2.4 million. And these are all through uh, some county departments, uh, uh, auspices, Family Justice Center is a number of these, but uh, you can see family, family court. A lot of this is staffing or um, uh, supplies, but a lot of it is staffing. So again, some of this would be, if the commissioners do fund these things, anything you fund with staff with our dollars after the time period, we're gonna have to think about you know, how do you how do you continue that funding uh, going forward? But all these are good programs, and we feel like under the mental health auspice of ARC would fit uh, possibly fully funded. And I'm not I won't go through the list of every one of them, but it's in the it's in the PowerPoint. You have the ability to read these and see see how you think they may fit into the community's needs. Uh, the next the next banner would be mitigating the economic impact of the pandemic. We've asked the commissioners to you could consider earmarking $3 million for a project in the QCT, which is our qualified census tract in Alamance County. If you look on the map there of the county, I know it's small, but you see the area in blue. That gives you an idea of where the qualified census tract area is in our county. And as, as Andrea mentioned, uh, the, the, the current guidance makes it much, much easier to spend our dollars in the QCT uh, from a federal perspective. We still, we always have to be compliant with state law, but uh, this area has been identified by the federal government through the census process to say this area of Alamance County would be about as close to a slam dunk for art spending as you can get. You see that uh, blue leg that's going off to the east. It's running up Church Street and uh, in the Church Street, Graham Hopedale Road uh, uh, corridor there, and then all up into north parts of Burlington. And we, we haven't specifically uh, 
identify what these projects could be, but if the commissioners are interested in spending in the QCT, a $3 million is a, is a placeholder. The commissioners could spend more if you wanted to, less if you chose to, but this seems like a dollar amount that uh, you could use to go into this area and identify needs and make differences and be in uh, compliance with our spending. And then we have uh, broadband projects. Uh, we've identified $3.3 million worth of potential spending on broadband. Uh, the majority of it is specific, has to do with our library system to provide additional Wi-Fi's and to run, uh, uh, particularly uh, the most expensive item here is to run fiber to the North Park Library. I think that would be very much appreciated by the folks who use uh, the North Park facility and, and would provide these other uh, opportunities for the community to have access to Wi-Fi. Then uh, the one that's probably more tenuous of a connection to broadband is the emergency communications for two new Viper towers. We have a need for two new Viper communication towers in our county. Viper is our network that's state provided that all of our emergency, the county's emergency services communicate over. And uh, we have certain areas of the county that need additional coverage. The idea here would be, could you spend ARP monies to install Viper towers if you were able to use those Viper towers to also somehow uh, uh, enable residents to access broadband? I'm not sure exactly how that would work. I think Bruce and I have had some discussions about that, but there are other communities we know looking at doing the same thing because these are expensive towers. You have to work with the state to just be given permission to install these towers. We have had that discussion with the state about uh, applying for the ability to uh, install two new towers in Alamance County. I think they are receptive to that, but this is this would be one way to potentially fund those, or at least some portion of, of the installation cost. Well, the new installation we did in the northern part of the county was about 600, is that correct? That's correct. That so was that a, gone up that much to two more would be a million and a half a piece? That, that was a VHF uh, a VHF system, so our, our, fi our fire and EMS still use VHF pagers, right? And, we, and uh, I think VHF is still our backup system yes. for Viper in the event Viper goes down. Oh, so okay. that was an existing tower on an existing site that we uh, installed uh, additional VHF transmitters. So these would have to be two new towers for Viper. So it would be the tower property acquisition. We'd hope to find somebody that would not you know, would let us locate on property with no cost. Now, would there be any? There wouldn't really be any broadband benefit to the citizens, though, from those fiber towers, am I right? So, so the theory is, you know, you're dealing with private companies. And of course, their incentive to expand their wireless coverage involves costs. And so if you build these towers with the capacity to, you know, the real estate to house the, the Verizons, the AT&Ts of the world, these are also in the areas of need. And up until now, they're like, well, there's not enough to spend money, so you would have to have a community partner that would work with it. And they are non-committal until they, they get it. So you would have real estate, the first come, first come bidder. You know, maybe you lease the, you know, they're looking for savings of money because the area is not populated enough to their bottom line to the private company. So if you put a tower up and they all have to put a tower on, you put real estate on there. So all they have to do is put equipment on. Maybe you lease it to them for 50 years for a dollar. That reduces their costs and they're willing to invest in that area right. for Wi-Fi and those kind of things. Um, you'd have to get further along the process to see and see who steps up. They're very tight-knit because of competition. Um, and the state has a lot of regulation on that. but so. We can't promise, but you build it in the same areas and you build it with the capacity that first come, first serve. It saves them a ton of money, infrastructure money, because we put in the infrastructure for them to just put it on the towers. Okay. But that's, that's, that's the theory behind that. We've done a lot of research on that. And again, commissioners, it may be that all $3 million worth of the cost may not be ARP eligible. Uh, we would have, if we go, if this becomes a project that the commissioners are interested in and want us to focus on, we have to start figuring out, okay, how, how much of this, is there a percentage, is there some way to justify through ARP guidance that uh, a portion of this would be um, eligible. Three million is our estimate as total cost. And uh, I believe this is our final slide, water and sewer projects. Uh, you know, as, as you know, the county doesn't operate a water and sewer system. However, 
uh, we do have a need for water lines to be extended down in Swepsonville, if the commissioners will remember. We had discussions about the uh, closed landfill in the um, Swepsonville jurisdiction. Uh, town water is right up the road, up at the corner, I believe, of Alfred <coughs> Lane and Swepsonville Saxby Hall Road. So we estimated the cost to run water lines down to a number of homes that border the county's closed landfill to be around four hundred thousand dollars. We feel like that would be an ARP eligible expenditure and would also put these folks on uh, town water for the future, which would be a good idea. And we've also looked at the possibility of earmarking ARP dollars up to the amount of five hundred thousand dollars for surface water protection, stream bank conservation. I believe this was primarily through Parks Department. Uh, Parks does this for access and for uh, um, conservation, right? So it could be anything from a trail easement in stream buffer or viewshed protection and uh, just protecting the uh, the stream buffers, so. Out on the landfill water project, 400,000, how <coughs> likely are we to be responsible for that sometime in the fairly near future anyway? I think our, our conversations with the state as we navigated that that issue with the closed landfill, they made it clear to, to us that if the county is able to extend water to these residents, that's going to really mitigate the, their concerns in a large way about what the future holds for those homes. So, you know, uh, we're, we're installing wells now, tracking the uh, plume, right, trying to make sure we can communicate to the, to the residents what's going on. but. It's hard to say what will happen in 20, 30 years, and I think the state indicated to us it would be better for the residents if they were able to tap into um, water just to avoid any potential future problems. By installing wells, you mean test wells, you don't mean water wells for the residents? Yes, sir, that is correct. So we're likely to spend that $400,000 or more in the future anyway. Very, very possible. And we feel like this is a ARP eligible expenditure also, so the commissioners could consider using ARP funds to, to do this. We don't run water lines very often. I, uh, I, can't, I can't think of a time that I've been involved with a project that did this. We've had a discussion, very, very initial, with the town of Swepsonville. I think they would be receptive to working with us to do this if the county's uh, interested in doing this. What's our water source? Town of Swepsonville. Uh, they buy from I think they buy for Graham, but I'm not 100 percent sure about that. I'm not sure if they have their own their own water source or not. They may have wells. They may have some communal wells, but I'm not 100 percent sure. About that. This is just water, not sewer. That's correct. What about Four Hills? I mean, they're just building goodbye golf. I mean, what does that look like? Is that all individual wells, all individual septic tanks, or do they have water and sewer since it's right there at 54? I, I would, I, if I remember right, that development had to work with the town mm -hmm. of Swepsonville to get approval to go in, so that makes me think, I don't know this for a fact, I'm, I'm speculating, I think uh, it is on town water and sewer because it's going to have to get, I see Sherry maybe nodding her head, Sherry, Phil. That's my understanding. Like Alexander Wilson? That Are they? they um, I'm not sure if it's out to Alexander Wilson or I don't not. Think it's Of discussion between them and the town, so I'm pretty sure that they are on city water and septic. We, I think we, the difference in this issue is not us providing water and so forth specifically, it's avoiding uh, being in violation of state or federal guidelines in the near future. Right. Of and the old landfill. Correct. Yes. So that, that brings the conclusion of the presentation of these projects, commissioners. I know that uh, at this point, the commissioners have November 10th set up at six o'clock uh, to speak with the public and get insight uh, from them about uh, you know other ideas from nonprofits. We have not included any nonprofits or other organizations at this point. This is strictly county government. Uh, there are community projects also, but it's really from the county's either previous work or things that have been identified once ARP funding became available. I will tell the commissioners for November 10th, uh, we did put out a, a um, email feeler to our nonprofit community to see if, who might be coming to try to get an idea if we were gonna have lots of folks or what was the, what was the attendance gonna be. At this point, we have heard from 10, uh, in 10 groups and uh, I don't believe I see any says these are all groups. So we've, we have heard back from 10 co organizations from our community, uh, young musicians of Alamance, uh, the United Way, Benevolence Farms, uh, Piedmont Triad Regional Council, and Impact Alamance to talk about Alamance Digital Inclusion Plan. 
the Community Foundation and Self-Help Credit Union to present information about the revolving loan program that the county has. Uh, Alamos Farm School System will be there uh, to talk about potential programming, as will the Community College. Jai Baker from Allied Churches of Alamance County will be there. Sustainable Alamance will be um, represented. Then we have uh, one private citizen that had uh, responded to the email and indicated that they would be there for additional info, maybe to speak, maybe not, at least for additional info. So at this point, we have a, uh, a public meeting scheduled for November 10th, 6 p.m. Uh, we haven't. For, we talked at the last meeting about you know location to be determined. It's very possible as we get closer to the tent, we're going to have more folks respond. At this point, uh, you know most of our facilities, whether it be this this space uh, or any uh, historic courthouse, could host host this group. Even if you did it here, um, we, we would possibly have to use the overflow. If we don't have more than ten, we may be fine in here. And I know that's always ideal is to have folks before the board. So, yes, sir. I think we clearly need to decide two things today. Uh, one will be the location. And as to location, uh, it's all comers though. It's not just those 10 groups or 20 groups or whatever. You could have many, many other individuals in addition to the groups. Uh, and secondly, uh, the length of time for each presentation. So I think we need to decide those two factors here today. Indeed, I think that would be good because I'm sure there are going to be a lot of folks watch this presentation and, and this part of the meeting to, to hear. We've had a number that have asked if we, if we would have more information also. So if we could figure out the location that the board would like to hold it, knowing there's 10 right now, very likely to be more just decide to come. That's just the ones that have responded. We have nine more days. Yes. Well, you have some people just want to come watch. Yes, no, that's true. Yeah. Well, we got the overflow space, and it won't be court after six o'clock, right? Yeah, but you have, what's the number for this this room right here? It's 40, 49. 49. 49. That's not many people. Oh. Uh, well, and that's a, like this. Yeah. So you really want to have. I would request out or suggest to this board that we have it at the historic courthouse, subject to the sheriff's department being agreeable. That's a good idea. Wow, Six o'clock, I believe that's Wednesday, November the 10th, at the historic courthouse. Is this board in agreement with that? Yeah. Okay. Sounds great. You want to make a motion? Well, let's also talk about length of time. Um, the second thing would be uh, I suggest either three minutes or five minutes per individual or group. Uh, if we start getting into lengthy presentations, we'll be there for several days, uh, potentially. Uh, and I hope to have supper at some point that Wednesday night. <laughs> uh, point being, what, what's the pleasure of this board? I'm thinking five minutes. It's hard to do a presentation sometimes in just three. There's nothing worse than to be dinged when you're pouring your heart out for something. I'd say five minutes. No less than five. Is more agreeable. That's fine. Then I'll make a motion that we have it at the historic courthouse and have all presentations uh, five minutes in length that we have a timekeeper to enforce that. And can we say five minutes and 30 seconds for you to get done? Because, you know. Either say five minutes and 30 seconds or say five minutes. Five okay. minutes and we're not going to like pull the lever and you go down a tunnel. You know. <laughs> Next. I mean, no. I mean, I, just, I hate for people to have that kind of courage. When you have that kind of courage to come before this board, when the school board just might just appeals, I felt like I was a Wizard of Oz. It's so intimidating. And you want to say everything because you're pouring your heart out for this. So I just don't want us to be so rigid. I don't want everybody to have an hour and 15 minutes, but five minutes and you do get a little grace period. Well, I don't think we plan on an ejection CD no. or something. <laughs> no. My motion is for. <laughs> How's that feel? <laughs> My motion is for five minutes. Do I have a second? Second. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Now. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, will that be uh, uh, webcast? Uh, yes, we, we do have the ability to do streaming uh, during the meeting, so it'll be it'll be live. Yeah. Okay. What will that allow for people to ask questions via yeah. Zoom? Yeah. So the, the, they would have to be present to ask questions, um, but they'll be able to view the proceedings, hear it, and watch it live as it as it takes place. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Thank Anything you. else? That's all. That's a lot. And, uh, and, and some. Of, I would, one thing I would say is the diversion center, uh, in particular, is uh, got a little bit of urgency about it. So if we if we're interested in uh, diversion and, and the veterans community project. Uh, those are two that we probably need to, the board needs to be considering, thinking about what level they would like to be involved, if at all, uh, and let us know um, at some point fairly soon so we'll know we can take advantage of any opportunities out there. On the Diversion Center, I think we need to explore uh, some partnerships like Pam was talking about with uh, Cohen and dig a little more deeply into what they might be willing to contribute. And if it's an urgency to it, we need to be sure to make them aware that there is some urgency there. And my understanding is we will not be making any decisions on November the 10th, That's good. but it'll be for input only. And then our meeting on the 15th will be making decisions on, on the uh, spending of the money. The commissioners are under no timeline other than the expiration of the ARP dollars. So, uh, you know, it, you can take this information and digest it along with what you uh, hear on the 10th. And then if any of these projects strike your fancy and you either want to budget funds, which is what it would take, uh, or even if you earmark dollars in some way, budgeting it is probably the best, and that's going to give uh, staff the, the authority and the, the uh, uh, approval from the board to start on the project, to go, if it's a nonprofit that you deem that you want to receive X number of dollars, our folks will start working with them about how we contract with you, the different laws that you'll have to uh, uh, adhere to and make sure their project uh, is completely ARP eligible. So. When are we expecting final guidance? I'm mm -hmm. not sure, sir. <laughs> there is no, no promise from the U.S. Treasury. The, the Senate bill that's in place, it is expected that if that bill were to be adopted, enacted, then final guidance would incorporate that information. So I'm watching that to, to determine the next timeline. I suspect that if we're beginning to have conversations with potential partners, you may or may not be willing to add funding that next the next meeting might be a little hasty. Well, I, I totally agree. You're right. Yeah. And no question about it. Additionally, I've talked to our United States Senator and our U.S. Congressman, and I think the targets are even still moving on the federal level based upon the input that I've received. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I totally agree. I would encourage you, though, I think everybody here thought that the Diversion Center was a high priority uh, and that you concentrate on that. Is that fact or fiction for this board? Well, it's been planning for over five years. It needs to be a priority. So all five of us are shaking our heads if that's a, a top priority. Very well. Okay. Thank you. Our health director is next. And you're always called Mr. Health Director. Never <laughs> mind. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I can't pronounce my name last night either. <laughs> um, just real quick, I'm joined today with uh, by uh, with uh, Brianna Lyles, who's our intern from Winston-Salem State University. She'll be graduating this December with a uh, bachelor's in health administration degree, and she's been helping out since September doing a lot of small projects and our vaccine clinics. And I also have Dr. Arlinda Ellison, who's the um, health outreach and policy. Uh, division director of the health department, so I'm joined by those two folks. Um, so to the heart of the matter is before you is uh, seeking your permission to submit a grant application and a reward of the budget five thousand uh, dollars. It's an FDA grant and the idea behind it is for us to do a gap analysis and from there build a strategic plan. Um, with that monies uh, there is no local cost match and there's no out-of-state travel. Second. Yeah, motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Thank you. I and think you're next on the ballot. I am. <laughs> so the next one before you is grant funding received as a subrecipient from um, a uh, Shift NC, a nonprofit organization. Um, the idea behind the funding is for us to develop a program. Uh, surrounding um, teen pregnancy prevention and STD prevention, as well as leadership and self-efficacy for teens. 
Um, and we plan on doing that by hiring a part-time contract person to carry out those um, programs. They are evidence-based programs, so they've been researched and they have appeared to have an impact um, based on what those programs are. Um, there is no out-of-state travel and there is no local cost match for this grant board. Well, these funds work in collaboration with the school nurses and ABSS? So they they work in you know collaboration with the school. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Uh -huh. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. You know, let's see. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tony. Uh, can these two ladies pronounce your last name? I think Dr. Ellison can. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't need to answer that. We appreciate your being here. Thank you. Bonjour, <laughs> Jean. Thank you. I just call him Tony Loj. <laughs> <laughs> I call him Tony Loj. Everybody knows who I'm Logie. talking about. Answer to many names. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even know that. The outstanding job that he's doing, yeah, I call him Mr. Job. Health Director. Keep up the good work. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, again, no public speakers. No, sir. Excellent. Um, can the attorney's report is there one? No, I do have a book I want to give each of you before you leave, but I do not have a report for you today. All right. Thank you. County manager. I have no report, sir. Right. I do have a question for you about that report. Let me just go to my notes for a second. Sir. <laughs> the report that he didn't give. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it, it's just a quick question. I just had a I'm just looking at the numbers, and you know how I am. Certainly. Okay. Um, the debt service, I think the general fund highlights. Uh, I see the county force and the education numbers are seem to be right there where we need to be as far as the budget is concerned, because we're about 25% away from our budget, almost a third. But I see down the debt service. The debt service, you have 1.231 million. Expend, uh, and it's expended of the 21 million. I'm just curious why that number is lagging the other numbers that we have. Uh, you know, the debt service is actually lagging behind the uh, budget. It's for when the debt service payments are due. What is that? They are staggered throughout the year. Um, and the thing to remember with our bonded debt is that we will pay interest payment first. Um, we actually have an interest payment today of $2.7 million on one of our bond issuances. Um, six months from now, we will have that same interest payment as well as the principal payment. With bonded debt, there's one principal payment and two interest payments in a year. Okay. And those normally happen in the spring of the year. In the spring. So it's just a time, time issue. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, how are we looking, now that, now that we're talking about it, on our short-term, on our short-term um, um, I won't call it debt service. I'll just call it our short term that we're doing with uh, our, our installment loans. Yes, with that, yes. Okay, so those are on schedule for payment as well. Um, those are with a principal and an interest payment that's due every six months. Um, and those are, again, they're just staggered throughout okay. the year. So it's just a time. time it's a issue. timing thing. And it's that's mostly right. it comes, bangs out in the summer, springtime. That's okay. correct, sir. Learn yeah. something new every day? Yes. We yeah. do not have monthly debt service payments, so that's why you don't see that equal 112 payment. Um, we are, when we issue that debt, um, even for installment loans, we do ask for semi-annual payments. Okay. Would you like that check yourself? Mm -hmm. Do you print it? <laughs> They're wired. Yes. The funds are wired. So you don't like stick stamp on it and go mail? No, ma'am. <laughs> Just wondering. They are wired to the DTC or to the um, financial institution with which we have the installment loan. I think it's it. And to help, help you feel a little better, uh, the checks, um, she and I both have to sign each and every check before they go out. So I see reports before those checks are signed. I'll have to send you guys some account numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a quick question. Uh, his his uh, report was done. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Quick question was taken on the uh, quarterly financial reports. Uh, we, we talked in the past about uh, the amount of revenue that's, that uh, ABSS is receiving in the capital plan. Do we have f close to final numbers on last fiscal year for how much uh, above plan? 
ABSS has received? Yes, uh, so in fiscal year 2021, the Davenport plan calls for the school system to receive uh, $6.78 million in sales tax revenue. That's, that's the balancing number of the plan. Uh, uh, for fiscal year 2021, we're looking at the school system receiving $9.4 million, which was about $2.7 million more than the plan called for, which is good news. Uh, you, you, we had Davenport run the newest version of the um, financing plan we shared at the OSC meeting, and you could see that the school system's capital reserve uh, has gone up uh, because of that. And in fact, we've received a couple of months of sales tax revenue for this fiscal year, fiscal year 21-22, and we, Josh's modeling is showing that it's possible the school system may receive around $9.7 million this fiscal year. Again, the plan to balance calls for 6.7. So um, those are all based on the, the significantly increased sales tax dollars that we've been seeing over the past year. And you know, as the board will remember, uh, there are certain articles and percentages that must go to school system capital. So we, we track that as it comes in and allocate it to their to their part of the plan. Do we have a sense of when we'll know from uh, ABSS uh, how much money above budget we'll have for the, uh, the bond projects? Uh, we, we, we budgeted so much for this particular school, how much we're, we're actually going to spend, how much we're not going to spend. I think uh, we had some information, I think, in our in our latest report that had the bond project activity, and I think the schools have been reporting that all their projects are on time and on budget. So we didn't, we haven't gotten any impression from them that anything is happening that's surprising them. Uh, but it may be as we continue to go through shortage of materials and increased costs that we'll see that later. But at this point, at the last TRC meeting and um, capital oversight committee meeting, the schools reported all bond projects on time and coming in on budget. So. We elected not to take uh, the seventeen million dollars premium when. Uh, did the bond issuances. I think that's the right decision. But I also think you know, we've, been, we've been pushing ABSS to give us a top 10 list of capital projects. We've got significant more funds here than that we, that we have, uh, had projected. Uh, there are also, I think there's going to be some savings on some of these projects, particularly uh, the one in Mevin, which is almost done, mm -hmm. the elementary school in Mevin, which is almost done. I think as part of technical review, operational review, we ought to start thinking about putting some of these um, overages to some of the high priority capital projects and maybe you know, six months into a budget cycle might not be a bad time to reassess this and see what we can get done. Particularly those projects where we could get DOT reimbursement. Yes, and I think uh, there were three remaining um, ABSS top 10 projects that were traffic, AO Elementary, Alexander Wilson, and EM Holt that were specifically on their top 10 list for traffic needs. So had a great conversation with uh, Mr. Archer that was here earlier about the uh, the movement that the commissioners have already done, committing some capital reserve, I think it was at the new high school and at Southern High School, if I remember correctly, to front ABSS the money. And I think uh, Dr. Thorpe and uh, Mr. Archer's folks have already been at work on those projects and talking about them. So uh, you know, that it, it is, right now the plan is working very well. In fact, the dollars are coming in and we're allocating it exactly as they come in above the, what the plan calls for. Um, the school system is building capital reserve. Even the plan is accommodating the issuance of, I think it's about $19 million in remaining authorized but unissued GEO bond debt. So the plan is still able to afford that later. You know, So uh, it, it does make sense to start looking at their top projects and figuring out what's the time schedule, how should we pay for that? Is that capital reserve? Is that some other debt in the future? Uh, the, the money is, uh, currently the money is coming in stronger than the plan. And the last thing I'll say is I think two of those projects on the top 10 list, Graham High School and uh, Southern High School, are locations where we're actually spending bond proceeds now. And that if, if we're gonna, if we're gonna improve that, I think they're for the roofs. If we're gonna do that, it makes sense to, to do that while we're already involved in capital improvements. Yes, uh, yeah, that's correct. So I think we need to look at the timeline so that we're not you know, finishing a project, you know, congratulating ourselves, and then six months later, you know, stopping everything and putting a new roof on. We'll make uh, these points a topic to touch on at our next technical review committee meeting. And OSC, by the way, means oversight uh, committee. That consists of Mr. Carter and I, uh, and several staff members here. ACC has two members and their staff, uh, and the school system, ABSS, uh, has two members and, uh, and their staff, and we meet monthly. 
So, uh, and then we report back to everybody through our county manager. And uh, the schools did mention at uh, both TRC and OSC that they are also interested in looking at um, replacing mobile units with brick and mortar construction too. So I think there's some interest. Those are not on the top 10 list, but I think that is an interest from ABSS is to start examining at uh, the schools where they have mobile units. How do they phase those out and replace those with uh, uh, stick built classroom. Yes. It would be on the top 10 if it could be. <laughs> the cottages. Yes. Ugh. I don't like them. Okay. I got one last question. Do you have commissioners comments or you have questions on that? I got, well, I got one question for, uh, you know, Commissioner Turner just brought it up. Um, ACC bond project um, for September 22. Yes. Is there any possibility of going earlier? Would we have to reach out to Davenport? I think uh, we probably would because if we move the debt issuance up, it starts affecting the uh, plan a little negatively. We haven't had that happen yet because yep. most of them have been moved out. And I think we'd want to um, talk with the LGC also about would we be able to schedule the issuance with them? I see Andrea looking at me. So if you've got <laughs> thoughts about this, please chime in. It's please. less a financial issue than are they ready because they sure. have to have their documentation ready. That's what I was going to suggest is uh, but was leading up to my next question. You're a mind reader. Um, I was wondering if we get to September 22 and ACC is not ready to take this money, like I should, I should, I guess I shouldn't say it that way. Um, things are have have occurred that push their schedule back. Mm -hmm. Would that be something that we would have to take in consideration? Uh, the reason I'm being, I'm just looking at the bond market now. It doesn't look too good for us. Mm -hmm. um, in a year, <laughs> you know, I'm just I'm just thinking forward. I mean, is there something? Is it one? Could we do it? Two? Do we want to do it? And three? Does ACC even have the ability to take that money and use it rather than put it in our short-term kind of situation? That we do I think those are certainly good conversations to have with ACC. You know, this time, if I remember right, for ACC and this issuance, we didn't have all their. Uh, biddable documents and everything ready and the LGC still a lot but that was I know that was because we were borrowing so much yeah. of the ABSS debt but uh, it, it, it certainly to do their training center and the debt issuance is it the uh, internal workings that it was child care two projects that mm -hmm. they were going to combine in this next issuance actually they were planning to do all of their issuance so they may have um, mm -hmm. they may need to break up their issuances into two different in future we may find that out depending on how it works out with their other projects they have a couple of projects that were um, uh, involved finding locations which have been delayed so it depends on what they are able to pull together on timing wise in order to either do two projects or split their issuance into two whether we'd be able to pull anything forward would that push the time frame for them out it like it's, it's September 22nd, maybe they have to do two is issuances, so they maybe, just for example, they do September and they come back in February, something like it that. Could, it could, it um, uh, In a situation also, if we take this money that ACC does not use, can we use our short-term ability to get the short-term rates going for the, forward? I mean, and, and for how much time? Is it um, so with the bond market, the, the 19 million that we haven't issued, that's bonded debt. So we would have to follow the tax laws when it comes to the debt service on that. Um, taking out a shorter term loan that would not be a bond, then there are other um, potential there that we would need to talk with Davenport and have them rerun some models. Well, I guess the question I, I should be more clear. Uh, if we go to the bond market and get that money for ACC and they're not ready to use it, like the suppliers and vendors aren't ready to even start working, would you take that money going forward and issue short-term um, notes against it? No. You would not? No. Okay. Could not, yeah. You're not allowed to do it. Right. Okay. You're not allowed to take bond proceeds and then turn around and issue additional debt off of those. Um, we can't do that. Um, if we were to accept the funds in advance, just like we have with the others, we would look at what portion we could invest mm -hmm. 
to create additional interest revenue, um, but as far as any other debt service, no. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, we'll talk with ACC about their um, debt timing and make sure they're still on target. If there's some benefit to um, a different uh, timing schedule, we'll, we'll talk with them and with Davenport about how that might look. Well, I've written, it just popped up on my, uh, I, I got inside a year and I start looking, <laughs> start <laughs> looking right. at three and six month notes. <laughs> Gotcha. Any other comments on the county manager's report? Are there any county commissioner comments? I've got a comment, but the first question for Director was you, Jen. Um, just wondering how the uh, infection rates are looking in the county. Sure. So, um, over the last seven days, uh, we have been below percent positive, 9%. In fact, we've been at 5.5% uh, as of today. Our cases per 100,000, I can't remember what it, when it last came before you. I think they're around 300. They might have been a little bit lower in the 200s. Um, but they're down below 150 uh, cases per 100,000 over seven days. So today I met with my epi, epi team, or epidemiological team, if I can get that word out. Um, and so uh, we'll be making the recommendation for the 10-day quarantine. Uh, likely go out, you know, this afternoon, most likely tomorrow when I when I get back to the office to be able to draft it and move along. So for for public schools, for, for all schools and childcare. Okay. Yeah. Have you um, looked into any more of the uh, testing, the new testing schedule you're looking at? Like, uh, I think you and I spoke about this. Uh, when we have like a group of four. And schools and one gets COVID and the other three go get tested. You are at one, three, five, seven kind of thing oh, the, with the um, CDC. Correct. Yeah, the uh, the test to state program. So that's the study that's ongoing is right now. Is anybody doing that, or is it just studying? So they're studying it right now to see what the outcomes are, right, and see. So the theory behind it is um, you're getting ahead of the 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 illness before they go from uh, you know symptomatic or whatever to catching them, and then and then removing them and being able to keep them in school. So if it has positive outcomes, then what the researchers obviously do is they type right up the results and then work with the CDC and the state to be able to possibly change the guidelines in the future. You think that'll be soon? Um, so the last time they did a study, it just takes a couple months to get yeah. your results written and then have the conversations at the different levels. So it does take a couple months to do. Um, they did move it pretty quick for, for a study. I mean, they've got the methodology and the research behind it. So. Um, I believe it is ongoing right now that that study is ongoing as they um, work that along. I will say, you know, the positive lining this is tomorrow the ACIP meets, um, and that is the immunization committee um, for vaccines. I, I strongly encourage parents, especially. So if you Google FDA vaccine, FDA vaccine committee, um, or ACIP meetings, um, the the FDA met last week and it's recorded on YouTube. But what's cool about this, you can actually hear the research that's being presented for vaccines for children ages 5 to 11. You can see the data that's being presented. For the most part, the, the presentation lasts all day. It's very plain spoken when they present these. There's a few academic process here and there where it gets red target and I usually just shut, shut it out so <laughs> I can understand it again. But for the most part, it's very understandable. But you can learn about the, the, the pros and the cons and everything they discuss in these meetings. It's all out there on the table about this vaccine. Um, I will say, having listened to it last week, very safe and effective. Um, and continue to advocate for it. parents. Please watch this for your children so you can make the, the right decision for your children because most likely at the end of this week, by, by Friday, best best case scenario, but most likely at the end of this week, going into next week, we'll be doing pediatric vaccinations for 5 to 11 over at the health department. Yeah, so that that's dosage that's is, on. uh, what, one-third of the dosage for adults? That's correct. That's correct. So we'll be doing vaccines at the health department? We'll be doing it at the health department currently working with um, Cohen Health and they have a, a they're working planning with the school right now um, to be able to do some vaccines in one of the schools on, on the weekend. Um, we have a couple things in the works and I believe the school system is also working with um, Walmart with one of the their pharmacies over on the, the Mevin side to be able to um, do some school based vaccinations as well. How can parents sign up? <coughs> Excuse me, sign up for vaccines. Yeah, so on our website we have the, the phone number to be able to do uh, an appointment, but we also have vaccinatealements.com. It has a schedule right there. Um, and we will get get, uh, get your child in and get it vaccinated. And this is the Pfizer vaccine? This is Pfizer. So it requires two doses? Requires two doses, correct. Even for kids? Yes. Um, 
couple follow-ups on, uh, on the protocol. So the, your recommendation at the end of the day is going to be a 10-day quarantine. That's for non-vaccinated kids, right? That's correct, for non-vaccinated kids. Okay. Is there a threshold below which you, you dispense with quarantines altogether? A so threshold of, back of, of you know, virus rates. Of yeah, so I, I can't dispense with the, the I, can't, I can't say there's, there's no quarantine. Um, so those are actually... Um, put out by the Public Health Commission, and then so it's in the administrative code, it's in statute. We follow the CDC general guidelines. Um, so the minimum that we c I can recommend is the five day test, seven day quarantine, with the additional seven days of strict mask wearing and social distancing. So what were the thresholds where you? So to get to get that number where I would feel comfortable, I would like to see cases per one hundred thousand drop below fifty. And for us to get into the moderate to low spread, so the percent positive well below five percent. So say well, well below. So, so <laughs> how about below, below five percent where it continues to go down and stays consistent, right? So when I when I when I say that, when I look at the data, usually I'll see the percent positive start to trend down, and then right after that we'll follow your cases per one hundred thousand. I say that it takes a couple of days for that to, to catch up. So those are the two data back in March that I look at. So we can get that percent positive to continue to go down below 5%, continue to drop, and then the next piece will be that per 100,000 cases, and I'd like to see that below 50 per 100,000 over seven days, and it consistently stay that way. Hopefully we'll be there in two weeks. Hope so. We have, we have a silver lining, right? We can get kids <laughs> vaccinated here soon, and that for opens the, up a whole new platform. For the booster shots, for those that qualify, uh, that's ongoing as we speak, is it not? That, that's ongoing. We do it at the Human Service Campus. We also um, hold uh, mobile events um, out in the community. And so they, the appointments still continue to, to fill up. So it's amazing. And if you had uh, the COVID virus and Delta variants, whatever, uh, there's a 90 day waiting period to get the booster. Is that correct? Correct. If, if you receive the monoclonal antibodies. That's infusion, guys. That's what he's talking about. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay. Any other questions? It's Anything? just very difficult for me to watch um, all these college football games and all these pro football games. And everybody's just having a time and watch my current president drop his mask to talk to other leaders when he's right in their face. And I'm not picking on him, I'm just picking on the situation and just it seems like the hypocrisy of it sometimes. And the least transmittable group is masked up like a, a bridle on a horse. Mm -hmm. And I know we have to be safe because I don't want any one little person or one big person to be sick or anything, but we live in a world that has diseases and we are never going to get to zero, ever, because it'll be the next. And it just, um, I mean, it's, it's been so divisive um, for our school system when I, I mean, it's just really tough because sometimes it can take on its own life. I know people, asked me about curriculums here, and I said, you're watching another school system in another state that's just flipping out, and you don't need to think that's you. But at the same time, when we see the adults breaking the rules, but yet we're holding these standards to our kids, and my daughter's a teacher, and it, and it is just hard with third graders not seeing all their teeth they got missing, you know what I'm saying? Because that's what you get to see, and I'm, I'm not, I, I mean, I wear my mask wherever I'm supposed to wear a mask, I go in. But if I don't have to wear it, I'm not. And I've been vaccinated, and y'all know the reaction I have with the vaccine. And, um, and some people, it, it does great, and some people, it doesn't do great. But that's also an individual body that takes that vaccine. But um, it just, I just think it's really hard on young people. You know, I, I watch them play sports, and I, 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 just, I cannot understand the, the normalcy of it and the hypocrisy of it. When I'm seeing our own leaders at football games this weekend, just I'm seeing their faces just having the time of their life, and I want you to have the time of your life, but I want the very same thing for young people. And that's just my opinion, but it just it just seems like it's so many standards that we're trying to adjust, justify for. So justify was in our preaching yesterday remember? Justify. <laughs> so I'm just that's just my opinion I'm, I'm just a commissioner I'm not God junior so I just I just want our kids to be free of this and enjoy their whole day without feeling like they can't even see each other and um, and, I, and I hear and I'll, I'll say this too I hear about the raises and the money that we've got set aside for all this money 
that's from ARP and all this to, to pay our folks that have been in the nightmare of this disease and didn't flinch. They went out, every, parks and recs come to the rescue with child care, and then I hear where hospitals are letting people go. Mm -hmm. And in New York City, if I was an arsonist, that is where you need to be because of the fire stations that are not going to be able to be open. And I'm thinking, how, how does this make sense to me? I don't understand it because, you know, during the worst times of COVID, nurses had lines on their faces from wearing those masks so much and, and just, I mean, they went to hell for this. They were in war and now just thump them away. I just, I think it's just pitiful. I don't understand it. Tony, this has nothing to do with you. I'm sorry. But, you always seem to catch my rant. I promise. I'm your best friend. But um, it, I, I just don't understand it. And I, I just I just see so many requirements for certain individuals, and it just really ticks me off. One rule for all of us. That's the way I see it. That's it. We thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. We have a motion to second. All in favor, say aye. 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 We're done. <laughs>Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.